Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, how you doing? Fade to Black, man, I have been waiting for this show. Today is Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, and tonight, Cody Lundeen is with us. That's right. Man, tonight, tonight, I, you know, listen, everybody, you know why I do this show. I do this show to learn. That's it. And tonight I am going to get my learn on, as is all of you. We're going to be doing that tonight with uh, Cody. We had an amazing week so far uh, on Fade to Black, you know, Monday with Cass Clark and last night, Laird Scranton being with us tonight, Cody, of course. And tomorrow, um, now uh, I'm going to give you a little update on tomorrow uh, before we get started with Cody. Um, We are going to do two different shows on the Arrow UAP report. Tomorrow during the day with Christina Gomez and her show, Mysteries with the History, we are going to do the Arrow UAP report. Her show, her version, her take. And then tomorrow night on Fade to Black, Christina's going to be on with me on my show. And it's going to be my take, my view of the UAP report and her color commentary on on what I think. So two different shows, two different takes on the same report. And I think it's very important that we approach it that way uh, for everybody. So you can just go through it, see two different versions, uh, everybody out there right now is commenting on this. And I was talking to Christina earlier today. I said, you know, I have not been reading anybody's take. I have read through the report. I have my own assessment that I have developed. And I don't want to be influenced by anybody else. I don't want to, uh, not right now, Not right now. I'll do that after we do our shows. I'll go out and read what everybody else has been saying in their comments. But I don't want it to influence me. So that's what we are doing tomorrow. Christina's show and then my show. Both of us will be (laughs) each other's guest. It's going to be a very interesting day tomorrow with the with the Arrow UAP report. So I'm very excited about that. But tonight, it's all about Cody. And he's got a new show out. We'll be talking about that and why he created a survival show without network executives. Those pesky. Net, nobody will mess up a show like a network executive. Oh, man, I love that speak, and I love that take, and uh, and it's the only way to be true is to, man, is to get rid of the network executives. We'll be talking about all that because he is a survival instructor of the Aboriginal Living Skills School, and he is based out of Prescott, Arizona, Prescott, Prescott, Arizona, which he founded all the way back in 1991. He teaches wilderness survival skills. After tonight's show, can I make it to day two? I don't know. We'll find out. So let's get straight to it. He's right there. Cody Lundin. Cody. Hi, Jay. Okay. How are you doing? Man, man, man. I'm so excited about the show tonight. Um, but uh, we've got a few uh, rituals uh, that we have to get out of the way. And the first one is the first-time guest disclaimer. 
Okay, so let's get that out of the way. Next time you're on the show, we're not we we won't do it, but tonight we will. And the disclaimer is this: Cody, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. Where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. You have to accept to proceed. Ten four. Ah, ten four. Is that is that survival code for? <laughs> Except I understand. <laughs> no, no, but I, I get it. So I've heard you're yeah. pretty shoot from the hip blunt, and I am too. So it'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And uh, now I'm going to start with this. You're going to love it. All right. Talk about network executives. I was with, I'm not going to say who. Okay. I'm not going to do that. But one of the biggest names in the survival world on network TV, okay? And there's there's a few out there, right? So pick one of those three. I'm with him. And in the morning, he says these words. I've got to have a banana smoothie. I cannot start my day without a banana smoothie. I go, what happened to the dude that eats bugs? <laughs> what? A banana smoothie? We've got to go out to the Los Angeles jungle and get you a banana smoothie so you can... What's going on here? And I just... The image of TV, who that person is, and who that person is in real life, two different things, man. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe. Now, does me saying something like that, and what I just said is fact, does that surprise you? No, not at all. And and it's that's kind of the point of me kind of doing my own thing. I mean, you can imagine the stories that I have that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> And so the problem with what you're saying is you said the word image. And the problem with that is you know, a survival instructor deals with people's safety. I'm dealing with your life and people you care about. And that's where the image, you know, we don't care about image. We care about honesty. We care about facts. We care about physics, physiology, and psychology because we care about you and we want you to stay alive. So that's, uh, it's, it's, it's not only uh, phony, right? It's dangerous. And who it's dangerous to is the viewer. And I'm glad you have me on your show because a lot of people are suckered in with that person or others thinking they're real survival instructors. And, and they're not. You know, I, I know, like you know, everyone has their profession, everyone has their gig that they do. And we can all spot, sp spot someone who's not part of the tribe, right? They're, they're, they're phony, they're playing the game. And so it's real easy for me to spot that. Unfortunately, for the most for viewers out there, is they don't understand what a survival instructor really does. The term survivalist is out there a lot, and that's your that's your red flag right there when someone says survivalist, especially network executives or whatever. Because in North America, those people shoot cops and blow up federal buildings. I'm an outdoor survival instructor. I'm not a survivalist. So there's a lot of misnomers. And again, me being on your show, uh, we can help clear up some of that because again, we're dealing with people's lives and that's the bottom line with what I do. Now, with somebody like me, um, where surviving in the wild, the, the idea behind that, um, my picture is, okay, I have to survive in the wild, but I'm going to have a sleeping bag, right? I'm going to have a tent, right? I'm going to have food, right? I'm going to have matches, right? I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, uh, well, anybody can survive on that, all right? Yeah. It's, we are talking about, can you have somebody like me whose idea of roughing it is a 33-foot RV, right? <laughs> I think that, yeah. that's, can you take somebody like me and, and teach me the skills uh, for the day that I may need them? Yes. The first thing that's most important is a banana smoothie. 
You know, you must have <laughs> one of those first, right? So as far as Jimmy training potentially with Cody, what I do in my Aboriginal Living Skills School is I teach survival courses in three different genres. So we talked earlier about the guitar selection, you know, and the SG is different from the Les Paul, which is different from the Stratocaster, right? They're all guitars, but different musicians pick them up because they have different tonal qualities. And you know what I'm talking about. In my school, I teach modern outdoor survival. What happens when Jimmy goes out and the Jeep breaks down and it's a 21st century survival situation. That's the most typical. I teach primitive living skills, making fire with sticks. I have a permit literally to catch fish with my hands, stuff like that, stuff that our ancestors, yours and mine, this isn't just Native American stuff. This is all of our culture. And then I teach urban preparedness with or without zombies. So those are three different guitars. You know, you, you take the guitar you need to go in concert with or in the studio based on the tonal qualities that you want and expect out of that instrument. What, what media has, what your viewers unfortunately have is this mishmash of BS from corporate networks who have zero experience on guitars, right? And in this mm -hmm. case, out for survival skills. So when you said training you, RV and whatever, people come to my courses and they either train in modern survival primitive skills, urban preparedness. They all deal with self-reliance, but they're different contexts. And we go out in the field and some courses are rough. Some courses start with the clothes on your back and a couple of water bottles, because that's the context of the course. Other courses, you bring a sleeping bag, your food, no tents allowed, and we train, but you can eat your peanut butter and jelly sandwich to keep your glucose up while you're learning how to light a fire and whatever. So I'm a school. I've been a teacher. This will be my 33rd year. I've been doing this a long, long time. And it's 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 painful for me um, when I've dedicated my life. Like if you had someone put out a, a crap guitar, that's a big part of you, right? That's your passion is what's on that back wall. And you respect the instrument and you respect the maker. And you're all in with your heart and your mind about what that should be. That's how I feel about my profession. So to see it really marginalized and people compromised and people's safety compromised on a bunch of BS uh, TV survival shows, it's, it's, I don't know how to describe the feeling I get, but it's not good and it's not fair to the viewer. I have always felt now, I'm not, I don't, I don't talk smack on my show. I just don't do that. But um, I have done enough television to know a few things. Right. I, I, I'm hosting a TV show right now. And and I have dealt with that. And I also know many people in the business. Here's the thing. I know sometimes rules get bent. But when I'm watching and, and I get that I, I do, I get that. But when I'm watching a survival show, I often wonder what just like anything else it could be a ghost hunting show right or you know whatever that uh that that sometimes the powers that are running the show behind the scenes are going to make decisions and so it's what's going on off of the camera and so we're watching somebody that's living in the rain, in the cold for six days, apparently with nothing. Is there a situation off camera where this guy's eating an in and out double double, right? And then they go back and roll the cameras again. And my aunts, that these are the questions. If I'm having them, everybody is having those questions. And, and that's just the way to how much of it is the real thing. And if you were going to put a number on it, is it 90%? Is it 50%? Is it 10%? How much of it is the real thing? Well, you know, you've done TV. Um, I've been doing teaching survival skills on TV since the mid 1990s. Mm -hmm. And before I go on, you know, I've dealt with a lot of television producers and a lot of television executives and not one of them since the mid 1990s had any experience in outdoor survival skills. I'll say that one more time. Not one of the TV executives or producers that I worked with since the 1990s had any experience 
in the profession of outdoor survival training, which deals with your life and your safety. Okay. We both know we've been on TV. We know how that game works. And we both know that the TV producer is a literal term. They're producing, right. they're producing a product. And we also know who controls that product. It's whoever has the money that's paying for that product to be produced. And we also know that all television shows have a flotilla of people called attorneys, right? Mm -hmm. And what people should know, what your viewers should know now is when I signed contract for a show I was on years ago, it was in 2009, when it was less crummy now uh, than it is now. And I actually had in my contract a non-disparagement clause, which I got defamed anyway. And I had a clause in there that the network couldn't have me do things that I thought as a professional in my field would be dangerous to the viewer and dangerous to my professional reputation. Now, you just don't put that in a contract nowadays. Nowadays, the literal contracts is they can defame you. There's a bunch of other words that I looked up that I had no idea that it's beyond defamation. They can destroy your professional character, whatever, and they can kill you. And a lot of the, the waivers now, and by the way, you're signing this before you do the addition. So you're signing your life away with no right to sue because I've seen this stuff because I get these things spammed to me about the new greatest survival show. That's what people on television on survival shows are signing now. And so to be on a reality television show in general, if you have no self-respect and no professional reputation to lose, there's a place for you on survival TV, right? And I'm not going to do that because I've been at the game too long. It's my life. It's my living. And I care about Jimmy coming back alive. So the answer to your question is we both know TV's produced. There's things that are real and there's things that are not. Reality television, as we both know, is, I remember Ozzy. I know we both like heavy metal. What was that? Like the Osbournes? Was that the name of his show? Wasn't yeah. it? With Ozzy Osbourne? Yeah. yeah. And I wrote an interview with him. He's like, boy, by a season three, the producers were asking me to do something that was just bloody ridiculous. And he just quit right? because <laughs> he's Ozzy. He doesn't need it. But right. no one lives such a fascinating life that we can be 110% gonzo wow, you know, without it being produced. And that's okay, right? It's a show. The problem comes in when the producers have no experience with the content they're producing. And again, that content deals with Jimmy's safety. That's a big freaking red line that I it do, is. right? Yeah, yeah. I have mad respect for that. And it's it's why, uh, and I, let's move on to survival stuff, but that's why I walked away. Um, uh, I got stuck into a, a, a five-year contract that I, uh, you know, that I was owned Owned, 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 owned. They own this, man. I mean, they, and uh, and and I, I just told myself I would never do that again, ever, ever, man. The um, the uh, the art of blowing smoke up somebody's rear end <laughs> is a talent that the networks have. It's incredible, man. And they did it just like, uh, and I, I'll just never do it again. As soon as I start to hear that stuff, I just back up. I just back up. I don't want nothing to do with it. So there you go. All right. So now let's get to the basics of the basics. I have, I have a Jeep. It's funny that you said Jeep earlier. So I have a Jeep and uh, I have a Harley. And uh, I live like I want to live. The Jeep is to go and do stuff with. It looks nice, but it's also done up. All right. But in that Jeep, I carry with me a case of water in the back. I've got rope in the back. I've got chains in the back. I've got a first aid kit in the back. I have a little backpack with, and I'm not kidding, I've got beef jerky and candy in there and uh, uh, matches of, of uh, multiple flashlights. Now that just stays in the back of my Jeep all the time. And I, I've never had to use it, right? Not yet. 
But that's that's my peace of mind. It's the basics of the basics. But if something, you know, heaven forbid, if anything went down, at least, right, I have the I'm not caught with nothing. Is that a good starting point? And is that a recommendation that you think everybody should have in the trunk of their car? Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of questions I might have for you. I, too, have a Jeep. You know, a lot of my stuff is obviously I have four-wheel drive vehicles because my business is backcountry, and so I need mm-hmm. it professionally. And I have saddlebags with gear, too. But, yeah, your, your listeners should definitely – I mean, the essence of trying to avoid and mitigate a survival situation is proper preparedness. That's what I do is I try to mitigate risk. So when you see a TV survival show that enhances or puts out phony risk, you know right there that you're being lied to. So Jimmy has a Jeep. He has a bunch of stuff. What bioregion are, are you living in? You said chains. Are you in the mountains? or? I, I, I'm, in the, I'm in the Mojave Desert. Oh, no kidding. Proper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Yep. So, yep. Oh, yeah. I also have, I also have uh, a tire inflator, right? Uh-huh. Battery power. Yeah. 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 There's some other things that, you know, just in case, right? You just never know. Yeah. If I'm out sky watching UFOs in the middle of the desert, you know, with my friends, um, and you go where the people aren't, when you do stuff like that, yeah. you, you don't go where the people are, you go where the people aren't. And and you're out there in the middle of the night, and anything goes down, and you trip and fall, you get lost, car doesn't start, whatever, the flat tire, whatever it is, you, you, you know, I need that kind of peace of mind. Absolutely. Yeah, literally need. And, you know, unfortunately, in, in our culture today, you know, Jimmy's a paranoid doomsday freak. You know, we're never going to, you know, in my grandparents' day, Jimmy would have common sense. Right. Because in South Dakota, you didn't go out into the prairies unprepared. Mojave Desert, it can be hotter than hell, as you know, it can be and it can be colder than hell. So hypothermia, a drop in your body's core temperature and hyperthermia, the classic desert survival situation, an elevated rise of the 98.6 degree temperature are critical. So the shelter, the water, et cetera. So doing knowing probably a little bit about you and your Jeep and the remoteness of the Mojave Desert, to not have that stuff would be a massive red flag and a big mistake if you didn't carry that gear in your Jeep. Okay, so what's your what's your what's your basic? You're speaking uh, to the audience right now. I gave you my list. If you had the basic basics uh, suggestion checklist for the listeners, what would you uh, put on that list? L- let me ask you this: What guitar is best to use? Uh, a, a Swiss knife. So the best guitar for me it would be a Stratocaster with Ingve stacked single coil humbuckers. So you have the Strat, you have the Tremolo, but you have the humbucker sound, but it still looks like a regular Strat. So it's kind of a Swiss Army knife guitar. Swiss Army, and you answered me, which I'm Okay, you got me. But what I'm getting at is the big questions like what type of survival knife should I have? There's no context behind it. There you know, isn't. Right. That, that's what I'm saying. You know what? I answered that question correctly, didn't I? Uh, because I yeah. don't have the context behind it. So I'm going to go into it with trying to cover as much as I can, right. not knowing what the situation is. Right. And, and I'll do the same thing based on the human body. So we need to deal with the human body regarding oxygen. It needs to be hydrated with water. It needs to have calories every once in a while. It needs to be sheltered from hot and cold. So those are the things. We have sanitation. We have hygiene needs. We go to the bathroom. It happens. So when I get a big question like that, like the big guitar question I gave you, you can't go wrong with, with, with human physiology, right? In a survival situation, a lot of survival instructors I know don't have any first aid training. That's like going to a truck mechanic that doesn't know how to fix an engine. So what you're trying to do in a survival situation is get your physical body out alive. And thus understanding basic human physiology is mandatory in my profession. And I was doing another interview a while back. And one of the questions that came over the air was, you know, what kind of survival training generically would you recommend? And, you know, I hate generic questions by now, but I went right back to human physiology. And I'll do it the same with your listeners, all of your listeners. 
If they don't have a basic first aid CPR course, wilderness first responder, know how the body works, know what makes it tick. And if you understand hypohyperthermia, different environmental exposures, and, and you can mitigate a lot of this stuff or help a friend or a loved one who's in crisis. Because what's going to happen if there is a grid burp is the hospitals, if they're there, are going to be totally overlaid. You know, they're going to be overloaded with people. And your little bout of diarrhea, a dysentery, or, you know, your, your cut or your burn because everything's off the grid now, your listeners might have to go it alone. So you really can't go wrong with good old fashioned basic first aid training. I recommend everyone get as much first aid training as they possibly can. Now, what about, um, okay, a knife, right? It's like this overlooked thing, but a knife isn't just a knife. It's a tool that can do so many different things. But if if you were, I have one of those folding uh, utility things that's got everything in it, right? Well, I forget what they call those things. But um, I've got that in, in, in my backpack. So, but you know what I don't have? I don't have like one of those survival knives. Is that something that's a necessity? I would think so. Cutting edges have been around for tens of thousands of years. But when you talk about knives, they're phallic shaped for a reason. And everyone's got their opinion, especially guys, on, you know, what's the best survival knife out there. And I parody that on the survival show with Cody Lundin because it is so ridiculous. So ironically, you hit on episode one in a parody I do about survival knives. And the main thing that, that makes a knife an effective tool is you. It's the user, right? You don't get into a Ferrari and instantly know how to drive. You're not a, you're not a race car driver because you spent the money and bought a fancy car. You're a race car driver because you trained. So what I like in a knife is a very simple knife because that simplicity, like that Ingwe Malstein, you know, single humbucker, Stratocaster, Franken, you know, Meister guitar, it does the most things. A simple right. blade does the most things based on me, the user, which is the talent behind the blade. I don't care if you have Eddie Van Halen's guitar. You're not gonna play like him probably ever anyway. Mm -hmm. But you're mm -hmm. not going to play like him uh, or, or be good at the guitar unless you practice yourself. So there's a lot of misnomer with the gear is suddenly going to make me a man. right? If I buy this $400 survival knife because so-and-so who drinks banana smoothies is promoting this because mm -hmm. of image and media and, frankly, lies, that somehow I'm going to be the banana smoothie guy drinker. And that's BS. If you want something, you work for it. Sounds old-fashioned, but it's honest. You're not going to let that banana smoothie go, are you? I'm so I glad. I'll tell you. I love that I, story. It, it, man, I, 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 uh, off of the air, I'll, I'll give you the whole thing. And when I tell you where it went down, you're going to go, man. <laughs> oh, and so anyway, um, uh, okay. And these are just the basics. I left something off um, that I don't have. But I've been thinking about doing, and now you're on the show. So help me with this. Blankets or a tarp or, you know, those old space blankets or whatever, right? Um, that's the one thing that I don't have. Um, and so point me in the right direction there because you can use it to wrap yourself up, right? Um, uh, th there's a lot of uses for it, but what is it that I'm actually looking for? What should I have? What's your context? Give me context. I, I'm, I'm thinking, well, when uh, something is something that could be dual use, right? Something that I could use for a tarp for the, against the rain, or maybe wrap myself up, or maybe make a tent out of, or mm -hmm. lay on. If the ground is, you know, it, but, but I don't have anything like that in my Jeep. I don't have any, okay. any cloth. So you're talking Jimmy's Jeep in the Mojave Desert, correct? That's the yeah, context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and you're out there all year round, right? We're looking up in the sky for, for, you know, creatures all year round. So you got the hot and the cold weather. Um, in my Jeep, I do have a tarp. I have a 10 by 12 tarp grommeted. The grommets are the little pieces of metal that allow you to spread the tarp out. And I have it pre-strung 
with parachute cord, 550 cord. Now in Jimmy's Jeep, that'll keep you out of the rain. It'll keep you out of the sun. You know, my Jeep has a roof rack and because I'm hauling stuff all the time. And so I would tarp that tarp off of my roof rack if my vehicle was down or blah, blah, blah. A tarp is multiple use, right? You can use it in the winter time with, with, with a lot of caveats and you can use it in desert sun. The blankets are awesome. You can tarp out blankets. Blankets are more, you know, off you. That's your that's your survival uh, multiple use knife as opposed to a sleeping bag. Although I love sleeping bags too. The blankets can be put up for shade. The blankets can be wrapped around Jimmy if it gets hypothermic at night because we know the desert because a lack of atmosphere. The deserts are some of the hottest places on the planet, but they're also some of the coldest because we don't have a lot of atmosphere regarding cloud cover no tree canopy. So all that short radiation from the sun that beats down on the planet all day long re-radiates back out as long radiation at night. And that's why the deserts can be, you know, frigid at night. So I have a tarp. I have some wool blankets. I prefer wool. Uh, they're getting a little bit harder to find. Don't do cotton. Cotton's a no-no. I prefer cotton in desert heat. But again, we're jack of all trades, right? Because it's Jimmy's Jeep. The blanket has to work in the winter in the Mojave. The blanket has to work in the desert in the Mojave. But you can't go wrong with tarps and blankets provided you understand how they're used and how they should be used to cover the phys human physiology that matters the most. So we're not going to wrap the blanket around our feet. We're going to always concentrate on the head and the neck mm -hmm. and the torso area because that's what that's what hypothermia or hyperthermia is. It's a drop or raise in core body temperature because that's where the vital organs are. If you don't have the tarp and you don't have the blanket in your Jeep, get them because they're very worthy additions. You mentioned, uh, let's, let's back up for a second, uh, where you said uh, the first episode of my show, I discussed knives first. <laughs> and uh, it, well, and I, I, I just find that really, really interesting um, because it is a situation where um, it's got to be treated as 101, right? Like you're starting with zero. And now if the context is what if you are caught with nothing, right? You, you are, that's it. You've got nothing. You've got your cell phone that's not working, right? Because you're in the middle of nowhere and you've got your shoes, your shirt, your T-shirt, Right, and you've got nothing. You don't smoke. You don't have a lighter. Uh, you don't have food. You don't have water. And that—that's—that's that's the situation that we all fear most. If you're in that situation, that's your context. Are you worried? Hell yes, because you're potentially dead. You can't get right. something from nothing. And that's another problem I have with these phony survival shows. Jimmy's not going to go out in the back country you know, bear hug a grizzly bear and choke it out, eat its flesh and come back with 40 pounds of fat on his body wrapped around with the hide to stay warm. That's mm -hmm. on survival TV shows. So all survival situations out there are caused from a lack of resources. If it's a lack of heat, then I might die of hypothermia. If it's a lack of cool, I might die of hyperthermia. If it's a lack of long-term food, malnutrition and starvation come into play. If it's a lack of water, dehydration can take you out, coupled probably with, well, either hypo or hyperthermia. You just clicked off all the resources other than oxygen that we need to live. So I'll be very, very clear with your, with your listeners. If you're a dumbass and, and you're totally unprepared and you have no resources, your risk of death is very high. There is no TV show, no survival instructor, no amen, Hail Mary, maybe that, that's going to bring you out alive. It is literally comes down to probably prayer and lady luck if you insist on trying to play it like you see the guys on TV. And I mm -hmm. mean that with all my heart. You know, it's mm -hmm. like I teach survival skills professionally. Like I told you a, a little bit ago, mitigate the risk. You have a survival kit in your Jeep because you thought ahead of the curve and you realize when you're looking for alien life forms out in the Mojave, it's a big, wide Mojave desert out there. And there's places that you don't get 
a cell phone signal, right? Most places you don't get a cell phone signal. Jimmy's on his own in his Jeep. So you thought ahead and tried to mitigate the what if situations by packing that gear you have. And that's what I call smart, right? So if you want to play with fire, if your listeners want to, you know, man up or whatever the, there's a lot of, you know, what measuring in my field, which is really annoying and it's disingenuous because anyone who's been in a life-threatening situation in the wilderness knows that nature's the boss. It's a very human and humbling experience to be looking face to face with your potential demise. It's not a joke. It's not a game. It's not funny. It's dead on in your face. Oh my God, I got to get out of this. It'll be the most scariest situation that your listeners will probably ever face being in a real survival situation. And that's the seriousness you should take it. And you can have a lot of fun with it like I do. I don't teach seriously because the content I teach is so serious. I'm dealing with death. If I just told Jimmy the rote facts about death, one, I'd scare the hell out of you. And two, I would turn you off to how to the beauties of nature and having fun out in the Mojave Desert in your Jeep. But what I won't do is BS Jimmy because that can get you hurt or killed. So again, advanced preparation. Notice how I've not answered your questions about the survival kit stuff. I've not answered your questions about the knife stuff because I want more context. And what you'll find in my profession is the people with the least amount of experience will give the quick black and white answers because they haven't been around enough to get their butt kicked enough to have mother nature go, "Uh uh-oh, you know, because she's the boss. And the cool thing I like about my profession and the thing that scares the hell out of me, uh, 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 from, uh, it scares me about my profession, is I'm dealing with the two greatest amount of variables out there, human nature under stress, scared people, and mother nature and all of her variables. So when you have that much variation, the more field experience you have, I hate to say, you no, know, because we know that there's a certain breed of alien called the greys, right? But in my profession, I'm dealing only with grays. There's very little black and white. I I assess the situation second by second, minute by minute. I apply the field experience I have, and I go into it with whatever performance needs to happen for the best outcome. It's probably a lot like playing a concert live in front of a bunch of people. You do what you can with the experience you have. You hope the equipment guys are up to snuff. You hope the Stratocaster does its thing. You don't break a string and you just go for it. Now, I love the word context. So let me paint a quick picture. It's a, uh, hopefully it'll be an easy answer, but (laughs) you're in a situation where um, you ate breakfast. You had that cup of coffee a couple of hours ago. Now you're, you're at the bottom of a cliff in the middle of the summer, cars crashed, you haven't broken any bones, but you're screwed. What's the first, uh, because you're on a time, that's it, right? You've got your last meal in you, right? You've got that cup of coffee you had, that that banana smoothie for breakfast. Um, (laughs) But... But now, you, now you've got decisions to make because you've got a window of time that you have to work within, right? That's it. That's it. You've got that's it. So, what's the first move? Is it hot out? Is it cold out? Did I go off the highway? Is it a blizzard? I, give I, more I, I gave you. I, I gave you all of that. I said it's summer. You, you're at the bottom of a cliff in okay, the mountains. I'm still alive. And I don't yep. have any gear in nope. the car nope. with me. Nope. My my if I'm if I'm not physically injured and I can't get cell signal, assuming I have a cell phone, and I'm not visible. Now there's been a couple stories in the media of people that were rescued by fishermen, right? They were they went off the road into a river, no one knew where they, they were there, no one knew the car was gone, and they were rescued by fishermen. I would try to get back to the highway, right? Because if no one knows, it depends. If Jimmy's cruising in his Jeep and he's going to see Martha, you know, and, and, you know, he should be at Martha's in three hours and Martha realizes Jimmy never showed up, Martha's going to call someone. So that's another aspect of search and rescue that we haven't got into, which if you knew as Jimmy that someone else had your back, 
that you were going to show up somewhere and you weren't just farting around in your Jeep and you didn't tell anyone where you were going. That's a huge mm -hmm. deal for your survival. Mm -hmm. I would try to get back to where I went off the road. You're saying there's no mechanical injuries. I don't have the gear to survive there. I do not know how wily coyote this cliff is. You know, we didn't get into that. There's a lot of variables, but I want to get rescued. That's what your listeners need to understand. Survival situations are not fun. They're not cool. They're not trendy. They're killers. And you need to get rescued as quickly as possible. And that's where search and rescue comes in. But I want to go back to the highway and stick my thumb out and do some good old-fashioned hitchhiking. Man, see, I didn't expect that answer. That is a smart, well-thought-out, concise, comprehensive, yes, yeah, it, it's not, we, uh, we need to build a shelter, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, get back to the freeway, get back to the road, uh, try to get rescued, try to be seen. Yeah, that's how you stay alive. That's the real stuff. This is not TV stuff. The main thing that a person should do in a survival situation is get rescued, is you want to get out of it. And so this is a gimme, you know, so your listeners when they go out on their camping trip or their day hike, and by the way, the day hike is the most le lethal situation out there. Why do you think the day hike is the biggest killer? Why? People think it's safe. Yeah. What could possibly happen? It's only what a three hour hike. Go? Yeah. Murphy's law, right? So the main thing is to get rescued. So leaving a game plan with people that you care about, where you're going, when you'll be back, what you're driving, why the intention that you're out there, who's out there, Cody Lundin, reasonable wilderness experience. You know, you want, you don't want them shouting, hey, man, you know, in the wilderness. These are all basic concepts that I address in both of my books, 98.6 Degrees, The Art of Keeping Your Ass Alive, which is modern wilderness survival. And when all hell breaks loose, stuff you need to survive when disaster strikes, that's urban preparedness. I have that 5W game plan in both books because it works in the wilderness with no moving parts about you getting rescued because someone knows you're there. And it works when the grid goes down because of an alien invasion or whatever, when you know where someone is, when the cell phones don't work. And, if, and you probably know how easy it is for that cell phone not to work, even in an urban situation. If there's any sort of disturbance or too much traffic, um, you're not going to get your call through. So this is about a third party rescue. And I'll say that again for the people that aren't hearing me. This is a third party rescue. You're not going to walk out of the woods like some hero. Most every survival situation out there that I've read about has always been SAR bailing someone out. And SAR is the acronym for search and rescue. The amount of people that get lost every year here in Southern California, it, it, it's crazy. And and what comes to mind is Julian Sands, the yeah. actor. And Julian, great actor. I mean, we you know, it's, it's one of, where um, because of the population here in L.A. County, you know, it's 20 million people. We have beautiful mountains. We have beautiful hiking trails. We have all of this. And people go Saturday morning, right? They drive out and park their car and they go off on these hiking trails. And there's hundreds of people on a trail on any given day. You're passing people. And so it seems like, right? Well, that's what Julian did. Julian Sands. And, and so you would have to think to yourself and it's a natural thing to assume he's smart he's in shape he's got money he's got the right gear he's got the right shoes he's got the right clothes he's ate well he's in shape you know he's got oh he and they didn't find his body for five months yeah Mount Baldy, right? Right, I mean, right, it's like right there. You can see it from my house, you know. And there is a lot of people um, in that area all the time. How is that possible? Well, it is possible. And Julian Sands is a perfect example of that, isn't it? He is. You know, that which can go wrong 
probably will go wrong, you know, and that what did, what was Julian Sands on? The simple day hike, right? So right. And like you said, they didn't, they found his corpse literally and uh, uh, months later. And so that's why people, you know, you need to play it safe. You need to, you know, you know, could, bad things can happen to good people, you know, and, and, and that's a perfect case in point of, of the simple day hike gone bad. And I don't remember the details of his case. And I don't like the armchair quarterback stuff. I do it because I think it's valuable because I, I do have the experience to give some meaningful background. I don't remember the details in his case, but it's sad, right? I mean, that, that's a, that didn't need to happen more than likely. But it did, and it happens to a lot of other people, like you're saying. And it's a, it's a shame because a lot of the stuff out there, there's always the, oh, God, it was just our time, right? The boulder falls on our head. <laughs> it's just our time. Most of these situations and outdoor survival situations are preventable. They are preventable completely by just common sense or prior training or both. The... Um... The idea to, I'm going to stay on Julian Sands for a second. He was going out for a day. So he, it's, he wasn't prepared. It's, it, you know, it didn't have a tent with him or a sleeping bag or any of that. He was going to go up and then come back. And he was reported missing right away. Now, uh, because he had people that were, like you said, right? Martha, right? Okay. So, um, it was Martha, right? So, so he had, the, he had everything playing in his favor, search teams, this helicopters. It's, you know, it, it's such a standard thing that we do here in Southern California and they didn't find him. How far can somebody walk? And that's, you know, how far could somebody get off of the trail? How far? Well, obviously far enough. Right, you don't play this safe. It, they, there isn't uh, a safe way to approach it. And when you're doing something like that on a day hike, it is easy to get lost, isn't it? I mean, like really well, easy. Do you remember? Did he go out when there's there was inclement weather on Mount Baldy? Yeah, well, I think there was a little bit of snow. Okay, but it snowed later on that night. I mean, I could pull up the facts of the case. Um, but the, um, uh, uh, let's see here. Let's just let me, let's see if I can get some details. His remains are found, uh, have been identified, confirmed Tuesday. His remains found a hiker Saturday. The, his body was found by other hikers. He was first reported missing on January 13th on Mount Baldy, a popular hiking area located in the San Gabriel Mountains, about 50 miles northeast of downtown L.A. That's where I live, by the way. Uh, this past winter, California was hit by a series of historic s storms. Um, uh, two days after Sands went missing, a mother of four died after sliding more than 500 feet down Mount Baldy. That same month, a 75-year-old man was found and rescued after going missing on Mount Baldy for two days. Several unsuccessful searches were conducted for Sands, with the latest taking place on June 17th. So, yeah, from January until June, they searched for him. So clearly um, he was off trail, right? He's obviously off trail. And whether he fell off trail and wasn't found or whether he walked off trail. Um, we, we don't know, at least I don't know. And whether if he fell, I mean, he could have died on impact, right? It's the mountains, you know, fell off something, hit his head or whatever. There's a lot of, of variables, but the variable that we know is true is he's dead. And he went out on a simple day hike, an affluent guy. I know that said he was an experienced hiker, whatever that means. On a trail he'd clearly done before, you know, right outside of urban Los Angeles. And, it, you know, it, it's sad for his death, but he does do us great service to, you know, if that doesn't convince you that bad things can happen to good people, you know, on a simple day hike, I don't know what will, you know, have a, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta plan for a worst case scenario, but it doesn't need to be this weird paranoid doomsday freaks type thing. He called Martha, right? Probably told Martha, hey, I'm going to hike on Mount Baldy. That's why they called in. But there's something that doesn't add up. He clearly wasn't on trail. They would have found his body within probably 48 hours. 
The wilderness is a big place. You know that when you go out into the Mojave Desert. Arizona has all four North American deserts. We have the Mojave, we have the Chihuahuan, we have the Great Basin, we have the Sonoran, we have three geographic provinces and over 10 different biotic life zones. We have more biological diversity in the state of Arizona in the shortest drive time of any place in North America. We can die of hypothermia and hyperthermia in the same day. There's a lot of places that don't have cell signals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you talk to someone in downtown Los Angeles, that sounds fantastical. Well, surely the grid is all over the planet. I can just call someone. No, you can't. So like Jimmy and his Jeep, you know, there's places you have to be self-reliant. And that's what I teach is self-reliance and, and stuff happens. And even me, I'm not bomb proof. I could be in a similar situation. Anyone can get injured or slip or fall or whatever. It happens to professional climbers all the time. We're all human. So I wanna stack the deck. I wanna be as prepared as I possibly can because I, I kind of enjoy living, you know? So again, these TV shows make this stuff appear easy. They dumb people down. They get people complacent. Well, so-and-so did it. You know, and, and yet they have the sandwich offset or whatever the show is. It's important that, you know, it's when you're on in front of a bunch of people with an electric guitar in your hands and you're playing live, you know, it's, it's live. It's fresh. You never know what's going to happen. And that's the wilderness in spades. Now, how do you, okay, now this is where I can joke about granite countertops and, and you know, the right shoes and stuff, but you how important is it not to lose your mind right you have to right i mean that's and and i would think if i'm with a couple of friends and and something like this happens the one that loses their you're going to somebody's going to show their colors right and then you suddenly have to deal with that too in addition to everything else how important is it to keep I'm going to say a bad word. Keep your shit together. How important is that uh, psychologically? It's huge. And I'm glad you bring that up because I've always written for years and, and, and taught that survival situations, in my opinion, are 90% psychology. It doesn't matter what you have buried in your backyard for the end of the world if you're too scared, stupid to use it. So what happens, like I said, variables, you have Mother Nature and all her glory hurricanes, tornadoes, ice storms, blizzards, wind, etc. And you have really scared people and you have the human nature that's at play. And what happens with the psychology is we know that it can screw with the physiology. There's been people that have been bit by a rattlesnake and it was a dry bite, which means there, there's no venom and they died. Why did they die, Jimmy? Because they psyched themselves out that they'd been bit by a rattlesnake and they literally killed themselves. The human mind is an incredibly powerful thing. And if it's unharnessed and unhinged, which it will be on something called adrenaline, when people are scared, you're gonna have people potentially lose their mind. And this is glossed over, you know, stay calm, be prepared. You know, it's like, it's it's so glossed over that, that it, it's, it seems boring, but it's critical. And what helps people be mentally and emotionally prepared in crisis? Training, preparedness, advanced thought, Jimmy packing his Jeep with stuff that he might need, realizing you're human, realizing that denial is not just a, a river in Egypt. It's what most people go out into the back country with. Oh, this ain't going to happen to me. Well, I, I watch that survival show on TV. I can, it's lethal stuff. So you hit the nail on the head. Your mental and emotional attitude and how you handle yourself under, a, under, an, under an adrenaline cocktail, I would say that's at least important, if not more important than gear. Because, and that's why when I teach, we want to teach gross motor skill stuff. There's fine motor skills, there's complex motor skills, and there's gross motor skills. F fine motor skills like threading the proverbial needle. It's one and focused skill. Complex motor skills might be like riding a horse, drawing a bow, shooting a bison in South Dakota. That's a string of fine motor skills together called complex. A lot of survival training is taught 
in those two genres of skills, which is a mistake. Because under real-time stress of a survival situation and an adrenaline spike in a human being, fine and complex motor skills go to hell. And that's been proven with police training. That's been proven in the military for decades. So what you want is to keep things super simple, gross motor, stuff that you can do when the adrenaline's pumping and you're freaking out. So it's not just how you train, literally how you train and what you train in. It's the gear you pack to be gross motor skill that has the most benefit when people are scared. Will you be scared? You're going to be scared. I'm going to be scared. Leave the TV bravado to the network executives. When you're looking at your life on the line, you will be pumped. You can use that adrenaline to your advantage. It's called fear. But you have to manage the fear. You have to harness it. And that's what you're talking about. And Jimmy might be fine because Jimmy's trained. He's talked to Cody. He's got his Jeep full of gear. But Jimmy's friend he takes out in the desert might be a freaking basket case, right? So you have to be able to manage other people as well. And that's the real toughie. There's a lot of leadership involved in what I do, obviously. And you brought it up. It's managing yourself under stress and it's managing people. And that's the art. I love what I do because it's a blend of the science and it's a blend of the art when all hell is breaking loose. It's a series of grays. It's very fascinating and yet very deadly. So don't take it for granted and pack your Jeep, Jimmy. The, <laughs> the uh, um, I, I joke a lot on this show, um, but uh, about when you're, when you're doing stuff with friends, tie each other together with a piece of string, right? And I joke about it, but I'm actually being very serious. And, and I've done tours around the world and, you know, and I've got a group of people together, somebody's going to wander off and then suddenly we've got to break up the pack. And now somebody has got to go and find this person and, and, and trying to keep everything in order. Well, when you're on a trail and you're out in the middle of the woods and you're a couple of miles from your car and, and it, somebody starts straggling behind, do not take it for granted, the person being behind, that if you're okay. Don't take that for granted. Number two, if you're the ones in front, don't take it for granted that everything is okay behind you. You can yeah. one step right or left, and you can be lost in the woods and never found. You, and you and I joke point. about it. Let me cover that, which is you bring it up, and I've rarely covered this in an interview, but here's what we do in the field. Because on some courses I do, we're remote backcountry, and the trail we're on is called a deer trail at best or whatever. So what I do in my course is I, is I have someone called a point, and I have someone called a sweep. And if you picture the body of a snake, the point is the person in front of the group. They're the leader of that tribe at that time. They're the one route finding, because at times we're not on any trails. And we're poking through the wilderness, finding the path of least resistance. Why? Because it saves calories, it's safer, blah, blah, blah. They're the head of the snake. That's point. Sweep is the tail of the snake. That's where I usually am because I want my students to be self-directed. They're not following me. I want them to follow themselves and cohesion into a group because that's what we call learning and not mm -hmm. being dependent on Cody. So like you brought up, now the, the point is always in contact more or less every once in a while with sweep. That's me at the back of the line. Sweep makes sure when someone needs to go pee, that sweep yells to point, hey, we got to pee or point stops. And if it's in the desert, they stop in the shade where everyone can be in the shade. The person pees, they fold back in. Then I follow that person as sweeper. So that's how we manage. Because you're right, there's been a set survival situations, several of them, where there's a group of hikers on a trail, there's a straggler like you're talking about, and I was like, well, where the hell did Laura go? You know, have a point and have a sweeper, verbalize this, it's not a secret, make the task known, and that's how we manage people in the backcountry, and it works great. Uh, me and a group of friends, uh, again, I'm gonna make this real quick. This is in the 80s, so I'm 22, 
healthy in shape, right? Are you sober? And and uh, I was. This was in the morning. Yeah, so I was sober. <laughs> So anyway, it was eight of us, two cars, and, and in Pasadena, and the San Gabriel Mountains are right there, covered in in hiking trails. Uh, the cars are just lined up up there uh, at the beginning of a Saturday, and everybody is going up Chantry Flats and Eaton Canyon and all the... It's beautiful, just beautiful. So anyway, we wake up Saturday morning. It's like, man, let's go, let's go. We pile in, and we all head up to the top of our street and and take off. I think it was Eaton Canyon. Anyway, as I live and breathe, eight 20-year-old, 21, 22, 23-year-old young men, all in shape. We managed in, in a span of about two hours. We all got completely separated. About <laughs> six hours later, I'm not making this up, Cody. Six hours later, one at a time, coming out of uh, off of the trail. It's like if we managed <laughs> to not only we we didn't come out in pairs, right? I it was like an unbelievable situation. We all got lost. We get lost contact with each other. And and somehow, and the whole day, the whole thing that we had planned was out the window, right? And it was just, I, I didn't know right from left, up from down. So anyway, yeah, it can and does happen. And it's things like that. I remember, Cody, I got scared. Mm -hmm. I got scared. I was lost. And I lost my friend. Next thing you know, I'm alone. And it turned out everybody had managed to get separated. It was crazy. So don't think it can or that it, that's impossible. Um, yeah. It can. It can happen. Right there in Los Angeles, in Pasadena. <laughs> it wasn't at the shopping mall. We were, you know, on a hiking trail. But we managed to uh, completely get separated, all eight of us. Incredible. Yep. Um, I am going to take a break. Let's do that now. And uh, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm speaking from experience. Our guest tonight, Cody Lundin. And when we come back, we're going to talk about his new show. I want to talk. I want to find out what his favorite, if he's going to watch a survival show, what does he watch? I'm going to get that out of him too. That and much more. When we come back, this is fade to black. Stay with us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, get your alerts, and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. My job is not to preach. My job is to take you on this journey. In a state of passion, nothing negative can happen. That it's the moons of those planets that would have life. Sometimes I see, you know, these energies also in your field. It is our passion and our pleasure. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month.
This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping. And you're going to get a tracking number. And with a Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go back, Lee Tappy. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Cody Lundin is with us. He doesn't like the word survivalist, but I'm going to tell you right now, anything happens to me, it's Cody that is going to get me out of it, and that is just the way that it is. Hey, Cody, I'm I'm, I'm going to uh, run down a list of questions. Um, uh, I, I want to hear some stories from you because I know you've got the best, but let me back up for a second. You're you're out there uh, under the stars. Have you ever seen anything strange in the sky? We were talking earlier about Art Bell asked me that too. And unfortunately, I'm not going to give the answer that your listeners want. I mean, I've seen some stuff that's like, what the heck is that? But I would love to see that, you know, cylindrical orb or whatever. And I really, unfortunately, I haven't. And I've been out in remote backcountry a lot 
for decades. But, you know, do I believe in extraterrestrial life forms? Of course I do. And I think you'd have to be really short-sighted to think that, really, that we're the only populated planet in, the, in this. We can't even see beyond, really, we we're just starting to see beyond our own solar system. But as far as what your listeners probably want to hear, I don't have that story yet. Maybe in the future. Oh, it is uh, just uh, that's all you have to do is is put the intention out, and 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 when you do, call me. And <laughs> you'll be right back <laughs> on the show, uh, telling me about that experience. Well, you know, you you you've been trained in the Aboriginal uh, way of life and and survival techniques and. Their history, we don't have to talk about UFOs right now, but but that's their origin story, you know? And that's, uh, uh, when you get back into the deep, deep old cultures like that, they all have that same star people conversation, right? That that uh, they came from and their knowledge came from the stars. And, and I love that. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Um, what is... You probably have many of these. What's the craziest animal situation that you were encountered with? <laughs> Running from or eating or? <laughs> well, I, oh, I, I didn't even think about the eating part. Uh, yeah, <laughs> running, <laughs> running from. Yeah, yeah, a confrontation. Confrontation. That's a, well, there was one time that was on a, uh, the end of a nine day course and it didn't turn into a confrontation, thank God. And we were out with all primitive gear. I had a rabbit stick, which is a throwing stick. I was hunting and gathering because that's the point of the tail end of this course, kind of in camo and, and whipped, right? Because this is where we're just using Stone Age gear in the field. And I was up scrambling on these rocks and there was a bobcat that was right there. And we're talking like, a really mangy bobcat. I don't think it was rabid because I know people that have been attacked in their tent by a rabid bobcat in Mexico. Not a, not a pretty story, but it kind of arched up like cats do and, you know, hissed at me and I had my rabbit stick and I was hungry and I was like, game on, dude. You know, if you're going to come after me, this is game on. But it just kind of probably sensed that, you know, okay, there's this sensation that happens and it is how nature survives where if I raise my hackles high enough, I don't need to fight because when I fight in the backcountry as an animal species or as a human, I could get injured. And if I get injured, I can't hunt and that could be my demise. So nothing really wants to get into it in the backcountry, right? Because everyone just bluffs it and tries not to get into combat. And so this bobcat went its way and I went my way. And thankfully, I don't have too many crazy, I have mountain lion stories too. Like really like remote wilderness, going to the spring, seeing this shape move down the mountain, it's dusk. And I thought it was a deer and all I had was a stone knife and I, I can't legally kill deer anyway. It's not, not under my permit, especially not with a stone knife. And it was a mountain lion and it was coming down from the mountains to a little spring that I was getting. And I was the one making the water run. So I had a bunch of gourd canteens. Again, this is a primitive living skills course. So I have a bunch of gourd canteens and a stone knife and there's a mountain lion and it's close enough because it popped its head out of the brush to go to the spring where I was that I could see, you know, the green, the yellow green of the eyes. And I was totally motionless in camouflage. And this cat came down, was about to drink, and then popped its head right up and looked me right in the eye. And oh, we man. looked at each other for probably it was only four seconds, but it seems like 10 minutes, you know, because you realize there's no gate. There's no fence. You're not at the zoo here. And then it backtracked and went out and its tail went back out and it left because it either saw me or sensed me or both. And the freaky part is, again, it's sundown. The sun is going down. I'm making the last water run for the day to our primitive base camp. When you go out of the spring, it's surrounded by heavy, dense vegetation, which is a perfect ambush <laughs> trail. So now I need to walk back. 
not knowing where the lion is. And eventually I saw his or her tracks in the sand and I had a good story to tell my students. But when you see a lion in the back country and you're in primitive gear and, and you're, it's, it's a really sobering experience. It was a beautiful experience, but obviously, and, and lions, they do attack people, but it's, I, you know, I went from this, I went from, oh, oh shit. I said the curse word too, because it's a lion. <laughs> right, 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 to, right, right. To, to uh, okay, man, if you're going to rock and roll, I'm not going to be an easy kill for you. To, my God, that animal's beautiful. In about one and a half seconds. And when I threw out that fear and when I threw out that aggression and, and love was the third thing, that's when it snapped its head up. It's like, okay, who's throwing me that vibe? It's very interesting when you're out in wilderness and you see wild animals and how receptive they are to energy. And I'm sure you've had plenty of talks on your show about energy, right? Sure. And about the effects of that that's unseen. And that's one story that was a, really a beautiful story um because i love these are lion claws and they're not i don't kill lion because it's what it's special to me for a variety of reasons these are actually jimmy from a movie lion that did production work in hollywood in los angeles in the 1960s and a good friend was was a, an animal wrangler helping this woman that had all these pets that worked in hollywood for the movies. I don't know her name. It was a female lion. And these are the small claws, but they ended up declining the movie lion because it started roughing around with the other animals and screwing them up you know, with her, with her claws. So they declawed her. So these are actually, because we're talking about television and whatever, these are actually from a movie lion back in the 1960s. Now, when uh, typically out in, uh, in the wild, uh, you bring up a really good point about nature. Uh, you don't, if you're an animal and you're injured, you're going to have problems surviving and eating. Uh, the same thing with a human, right? So you don't necessarily want confrontation. You want to go out and eat, right? But you're not looking for trouble. Um, and so when humans get attacked, is it, the hu is it usually the human's fault, right? Is it the human making the mistake here? There's a lot of variables in that question, as you can imagine. Sometimes it's flat out rabies. You know, I've been, I, I know people that have shot mountain lion who turned around and the lion's jumping at them. And it turns out that lion had got into a porcupine and it could no longer do regular stuff because it was all infected where it had got into the spines of the porcupine. Um, I know people, again, with the, the rabid bobcat. So rabies and certain diseases and malnutrition, malnutrition and starvation, those cause animals to do things they normally wouldn't do, right? So that's one sure. variable about the question you're asking. And the other question is just Los Angeles, habituation. Lots of people, they get real comfortable, you know, hey, there's a little kid running and it's running and it's prey and the lion's hungry. So part of it is our fault as people and not understanding wildlife. And then part of it is wildlife that's probably compromised. And part of it is it's wild life, <laughs> right? And and who knows, they got their own agenda going on. Now, uh, taking a selfie with the bear. Right. And, 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 yeah, I know. Right. And when I see it's just like that is like the dumbest idea ever. Yeah. Um, and and people think that, well, you know, yeah, man, a, a, a selfie with a rhinoceros. Why not? Right. I, I just don't think that that's a good idea. But, no, but and a lot of human stupidity. There used to be a gene pool and it used to function. And you, you, to be in the back country, to be a part of a tribe all over the world, um, you know, you couldn't be stupid and go out in the wilderness and survive for very long. Now we can. We have sat phones and, and you know, uh, cell phones and all these different things where people can put common sense in the back seat and go out thinking they have it all covered and come compromised. So that's just the gene pool thing. And I'm a big fan of the gene pool. And it, 
in any emergency, it comes back, right? In any emergency, we'll show you who you are and who your friends are and who your family is. And it's usually not a pretty story because we're a pretty spoiled culture. But the selfies, there's been a lot of Yellowstone in the news. I love Yellowstone, you know, Yellowstone Park. And a lot of dumb, dumb tourists with moose, with bear, whatever. And if you insist on taking a selfie with the bear, that's the gene pool at work. And, and again, those people shouldn't breed. So the bear is actually doing our culture and our society a favor. Man, that is the funniest thing. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm, I'm laughing with you, but uh, that is, that's a heck of a quote. The gene pool used to work. And yeah, yeah. Let's see how close we can get to the edge of the volcano for this next selfie. You know, it's just like, it's, what are you doing? What do you, this is, this is not going to end well. Um, now I wanted to ask you, uh, I've got a whole list of things. I want stories out of you, but if you, if it, what, what does Cody watch when it comes to a survival show? Is there something from the past? Is there something new? What would you watch? Cody doesn't watch survival shows because Cody knows better. Uh, me watching a survival show would be like eating vomit off the floor. I would rather eat the meal and not the vomit. The reason it's vomit is it's been messed with by people that don't understand the content and context, like we talked about earlier, and it's phony drama. You know, since a lot of people in, in network media don't have any experience in outdoor survival skills, and just as importantly, they don't have any teaching experience, the fallback for most of those shows is phony drama. And I'm not saying people aren't getting their butt kicks on some of these show, but there's the waivers have been signed. The attorneys are present, right? You've done all this stuff. I know how it works. You know how it works. It's not fun because I, I can see the little guy, what Wizard of Oz, who's the guy behind the curtain? I'm behind the curtain, right? So it's not, uh, it's insulting. Uh, uh, most people on survival TV shows are not even, they're not survival instructors. And why would I watch someone bumbling around? I mean, would you want to watch some dude that doesn't know how to play guitar, get up there and just like, get off the stage, man. This is an open mic night. Put on Metallica. That's what I'm here to see. Over to your right. If you look at the bottom, it says private chat. Click on that. Private chat. All the way to the right. Chat with everyone in the studio? No, that... no, no, no. Private chat. Oh. You see that? Yeah, from Click you. On... Yeah, now don't say it out loud. No, it's I, figured private. That, I figured that's that was the yeah, answer. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that stays between us, but uh, I, I thought that. Yeah, a, lot of damage, <laughs> a lot of damage has been done. Yeah, man, you know, I'm telling you. Like I'm telling you. I spent like two weeks with that guy. I'm so. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the most, if you were going to, what, where's the most dangerous, what's the most dangerous place in your opinion, uh, to go to? And I ask that because for somebody like you, that's the challenge, right? You want to notch it up higher and higher, right? You, you don't want to go to Disneyland to survive. Well, actually, that 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 would take survival skills, but, <laughs> but but for you, what's a dangerous place? And and give us an experience from there. Well, for your listeners, because they're the they're why we're here. I would say the most dangerous place is the one that that you'd have the least training in, right? You don't know how it works. I mean, I'm in Arizona, so I have deserts, I have mountains, we have a little bit of everything. And people freak when they think of the desert. I'm pretty comfortable in the desert. It's, desert survival is one of my fortes. But when someone comes from Virginia and trains with me on a desert survival course, like I have coming up literally in April, it's a scary place. And it's a scary place because of the unknown. And I'm not saying, as you know, that the desert is not a like, whoa, a place to have mad respect for because there's lots of ways to die in an area with the least amount of resources, water is key. 
water for year, you know, biological survival. Water brings the plants. Water brings the animals. So any place that's going to be the most strategically difficult to survive is probably going to be an arid landscape. But it doesn't have to be dry. We could think of the ocean not as an arid landscape, but it's salt water. You know, when you're just bobbing on the top of the ocean, it seems to be devoid of life. It's not supporting your life. Being in the desert is a lot like being on top of the ocean. They're very, very challenging places to get by because the resources are locked in or tightened down or hidden or they're not there in general. So for me, um, I'd say, you know, what influences me the most, what scares me the most about backcountry is, is lack of resources, mainly water, right? There's, there's places in, in your Mojave and my, we have the Mojave too, but you might have hours, maybe a day if you do stupid stuff before you die of hyperthermia and dehydration, depending on, depending on a host of variables, right? There's a lot of variables to what we're talking about. The other thing that scares me a lot is cold weather, winter. When you're in really cold weather, that environment gives you very, very, very little chance for error. You might have one decision to make, and if it's the wrong decision, that could cost you your life. Um, so extremes, I'm not, I'm not jonesing for a fix. I don't need to challenge myself. I don't really want to challenge myself. I don't. I want to have a good time in the wilderness, whatever that means to me. But biologically, what makes the wilderness the most challenging place are the extremes of hot and cold or too wet or too dry. It's always the extremes that kill more frequently than the middle of the road places. Like the woods. The well, woods next to a stream. <laughs> the woods can be in Alberta, Canada in January and kill you in two hours. Or the woods can be in Connecticut 20 miles out from the from the grocery store and just be covered with mosquitoes and ticks and be an unpleasant experience. There's a difference between a survival situation and an unpleasant experience. A survival situation is one that you don't get out of, you're gonna die. And so are the people with you potentially. Most people get themselves compromised in an unpleasant experience and they try to adapt to that unpleasant experience enough to get out alive, usually via third-party rescue, via search and rescue, like we talked about earlier. But the really, really harsh climates are the ones to take note. But most people prepare for those, right? When you go winter camping, you don't just go out in your, you know, your... Your you know, sandals clothes. and shorts. Yeah. Well, yeah. I might, but I have three pairs of socks to go along with it. But you go prepared. And that that simple day hike with the perfect weather and, you know, Janice, just leave the, the, the coat in the truck. Those are lethal because, one, people aren't materially prepared with gear. And like you brought up earlier, they're mentally not and emotionally not prepared for a crisis to happen. So when it does happen and there's no emotional and mental buy-in, that's when you get the catatonic, ghost in the heads light look of someone who can't believe they're the walking wounded in emergency the people that literally walk around in shock and that's a place you don't want to be and what if you uh, share with us a, a a survival story of your own where you 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 faced it i was a little boy and my dad was military uh, he was in the Air Force, and we were stationed in Germany for zwei Jahre. Wo ist die Toiletten? Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six, sieben. That's about all the Deutsch I can remember at this point. And me it was too. I, 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 I was in Germany. Yeah, I was in Germany, military brat. And uh, that's about all I walked around. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Frankfurt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. So uh, continue. What happened? Um, it was Christmas, and my family uh, took us to Austria to go skiing. And if you've ever been skiing in some of these resorts in Europe, uh, it was late, and it was approaching evening, and uh, I'm an only kid, which probably explains a lot. And my parents gave me a lot of freedom uh, as I was growing up, and so I was skiing solo. I was skiing alone, and it was starting to get dark in the evening, and before it was, 
I saw a sign on one of the downhill uh, uh, skiing routes that said Germany. And in my kid brain, I was like, well, I live in Germany. So I skied into the wrong freaking country and was in Germany when my folks were in Austria. And it got started to get dark. And I realized uh, all the people were gone. And again, it's winter time. We're in the mountains and we're skiing. So heavy snow cover, hypothermia uh, land. And I walked on my skis back to, you probably do you remember what a guest house means and what they are? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A guest house that was there on the slopes. And I was probably eight years old, very scared, uh, uh, very, now it's dark and I'm in a winter landscape and no one's around. But someone was in the ghost house because a lady lived there and I, I was crying and I was beating on the door, bawling my eyes out. And this window opened in the second story of us, us, which you probably remember what that means. What is that? And a lady, you know, looked out and saw this little boy crying and then uh, came down and got me and, and made this guy. They had a little cafeteria in there, made this guy. They, she fed me soup. I'll never forget her. And, and she was clearly the boss of the Gast house and was talking German and ordered this guy. And they put me in a snow cat and uh, took me in about a half hour, 45 minute ride in a snow cat to the parking lot where my parents were um, very relieved parents with a bunch of other people that had stayed back because this could have been the kid found dead in the woods. This was a classic hypothermia lost in the winter mountains in a foreign country when I'm eight years old. You know, that was my first brush <laughs> with being prepared. And I'll never forget that lady. And I'll never forget that soup. And like like your listeners who have been in a stress situation will never forget it. And hopefully they'll channel that energy and that disruption in their life to, to make life better in the future so it can be a happier place. It sounds like you kept your cool, though. No. You were crying. I, I was no? freaking you were freaking, I, but I went to, I found habitation. Okay. So I kept my cool enough to realize I'd screwed up and I went back the way I came again. It was a long time ago, but I found the, the ghost house on there. So I, I did the right thing, but I was scared stupid. A couple of years ago, I was with um, two or three of the guys from that expedition I told you about where the eight of us got separated mm -hmm. and there, there was three, there was four of it, four of the eight. And uh, we were at this club. Anyway, somebody brings that up. They were like, man, that was so good, man. That was so, that was so fun. And I was, I was like, dude, no, that was not, <laughs> that was not a good memory. And they were laughing. I was like, man, I panicked, man. And they all admitted too. But it was kind of weird how their recollection of it, you know, as time has passed. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, no, no, no. And I did not like recalling the memory with them. I, I panicked. I, well, it was not a good feeling. It was not a good feeling. It's not, it's not weird either. What what your listeners should know, we do some pretty pretty challenging courses at my school. Um, very remote backcountry, limited gear. I've seen people puke. I've seen people poop their pants. I've seen people cry. I've seen, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff. And the really traumatic, challenging experiences that really, in a sense, make a course, they define the man or the woman at that time. And they're always remembered. Even a day later, they start to get romanticized and it wasn't that cool. So years later, it doesn't surprise me at all that you and your, your, your buddies are like, yeah, it wasn't that great. I've seen that happen in less than 24 hours. And, you know, maybe that's a survival mechanism in itself to stamp down the horrors of what was really going on. But I need to bring it up on your show because I think it's important for your listeners to know that, um, to, to maintain the truth, you know, not to be a buzzkill, but yeah, that was a life-threatening situation. You and your buddies could have gotten, you know, permanently lost and they found your body after the next snow. I know, I know. I know. I'm, I'm telling you, that's, you know, that's the part, that's the part where I go into the uncomfortable zone. Yeah. We got separated 
And it can happen. I mean, eight, eight, we're talking about, you know, in shape, not out of shape, you know, limping along. We were, you know, 22 year old strapping young men uh, uh, um, two miles from our house up in Eaton Canyon. What, what could go wrong? Well, obviously something can. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, let me ask you this. I, I've got I've got to go here. Um, Bigfoot. Yay or nay? Have you had an experience? What have you no. seen? Have you seen footprints? No. Have you heard no. things? No. But when I was a little kid, I read every book on Bigfoot and UFOs and the Loch Ness Monster that I that I could, you know, because I'm I've always been fascinated with that. Do I right. think Bigfoot was? out or is out there and of, of course here's here's a story that you know because there's a lot of nonsense in my field out there there's a book called the long walk which is a must read and it has a polish name i forget the name it was made into a horrific movie called whatever where they butchered a great story as only hollywood sometimes can right and in this story the writer uh, this guy was going to interview this Polish man who, this is a World War II story. And they went through the Russian prison camps, ended up, you know, broke out of Siberia, you know, walked out of the Siberian prison camp, walked to the, you know, through the Gobi Desert, over the Himalayan mountains. I mean, this is an epic story of survival that lasts several months. But this guy that approached this Polish guy, literally knock, knock, knock at the door was writing a story about the abominable snowman. And he'd heard that this Polish guy in this village had seen Bigfoot, essentially in the Himalayan mountains or a variety of Bigfoot. And so the guy knocked on this guy's door and he said, I've heard you've seen the abominable snowman. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm doing some research. I'm wondering if you would talk to me. And the guy said, yeah, but that's only part of the story. And had this researcher not done that, we would have lost this amazing story of survival. Now, what they did in Russian prison clothing, I won't go into this. Your readers, or your listeners, I mean, it is a, it's a must read. It's probably, there's the, 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 the thing on Netflix now with the rugby team that went down, right? And that's an yeah. awesome story too. But this one, The Long Walk, is, is, is epic. And they were climbing over the Himalayan mountains in prison garb. And they were going through this mountain snow pass. And this is in the book. They came across two large beans sitting there covered with white hair. <laughs> and then this group, the, 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 the humans were like, oh, crap, what are we? And they deviated. And one of them actually fell to their death in a crevasse because they didn't want to go through Bigfoot. And they were, I guess they were just like hanging. It's like, yo, Fred, what's going on? You know, they're just sitting there in the snow in a mountain pass, you know, the abominable snowman, the real deal. So, and this is a guy who has nothing to gain by telling this, like a lot of your listeners or people on your show, right? They don't, why would I be attacked by modern media by saying that I've seen Bigfoot, which I have not, by the way, but this guy did, and there was three or four of them, and I thought that was really fascinating because there's very few stories about that species, you know, way up at elevation in the Himalayas. But they saw two of them deviated because they didn't want to go towards them, and that was part of that story. Yeah, I spent a lot of time uh, in Northern California. And I live on the West Coast, but I've got family up there. I'm talking, when I say nor Northern California, not San Francisco, okay? I get it, yeah. Uh, up north. And I uh, spent a lot of time up there. And when you, uh, you know, extended time, not, not for the weekend, you know, I spent months and months up there. And when you do that, there's a revelation that hits you, Cody, when you're deep in the redwood forest and you're looking at the rolling hills of redwoods that go on for hundreds of miles in, in every direction, there's one chilling thought that passes through my head. Anybody has it. Everybody does. No humans have ever walked there. 
right? That, that's a fact. It's a fact. It's just a fact. It's so dense and so thick. Now, it, 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 humans have been around it, but you can look on, you know, on a hillside and you know nobody has ever walked there. Ever. So yeah, if, you, you know what I mean? And so sure. if you're out, you're not going to get found. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's going to find you. And if you are Bigfoot or if you are any wild animal, that's where you're hanging out. You're not hanging out up here by the road. You're off doing your thing out there. And if you choose to do that and you do get lost or you do get in trouble, there is nobody there to come and find you. Well, you know, a lot of the Northwest Coast tribes, native native peoples, they have their stories of the big hairy guy, right? So that's real common. I mean, that bioregion has a lot of stuff that, you know, I haven't heard of many desert Bigfoot. Maybe there were, but there's not a lot of resources. Again, we're talking resources, whether it's Bigfoot or whether it's an outdoor right. survival situation, you got to have resources uh, to survive. And the Northwest Coast and up into, you know, Canada, British Columbia, Alberta, I mean, there's some vast, vast country, as you know, and it's, it's cool, right? Because we, we think we all, we got it figured out as humans. And that's just another form of arrogance that, you know, we really don't, we really don't even know how, really how a plant grows. You know, there's photosynthesis and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, the miracle of that or the redwood, I mean, it's like, it's cool, you know, because it's, we, we live on a beautiful planet. There's lots of stuff to explore. Uh, can we uh, uh, talk about uh, your supporting cast for a second uh, for the new show and how this is being put together <laughs> and, and why you have selected them? Yeah. Um, so we're on Fade to Black. And before I go on, did Metallica name their song after your show or vice versa? They they stole it from me. I so it, you know, it's just the way. You know, sometimes you just have to let things go. I know. And I've, I, I just chose to let it go. You're All the right. bigger man for that, and I respect <laughs> that. So in that same tongue-in-cheek, uh, we had a casting call in Las Vegas because you can find whatever you want in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I have a host, a co-host, and characters on my show. And uh, part of that was to drive the narrative forward in a way that was entertainingly educational. I've been a teacher for a long time. My mom was a teacher. My grandma was a teacher, literally, in a one-room schoolhouse in South Dakota. So that's in my blood. In the set of the survival show with Cody Lundin at my, my desk in my 1971 streamlined travel trailer with lava lamp and green shag carpet because the show takes place in the 70s. I literally have my grandma's brass bell that she rung to get her students' attention back in the day. Now that attention span is what I'm trying to talk about and we don't have one anymore, if you've noticed. So what I've had to do as an educator is to kind of trick people into learning uh, by by entertaining people. Um, but the information is solid, but the delivery is, uh, I'll just say it, I took a lot of acid when I was a kid. Hallucinogenics were my drug of choice. And um, not anymore, but it's it's that that colors and, and rhythm and vibration and sound. I know how to teach people because I spent a lot of time looking at real students, including in a college and university setting, teaching survival skills and understanding when they're listening to, to fade to black with Jimmy or when they got their head and they're, they're passed out in front of you. So what people respond to is color, song. You know, they, they need to be stimulated because we have the attention span of a gnat. So some of my co-hosts are pretty wild. And the show is wild in general, and that's mainly to keep people's attention so they learn the critical skills of survival that the show imparts. So let's go down the list. I, Dead Fred. Dead Fred. Dead Fred's kind of a gas. He's he's not politically correct, um, but we hired him anyway. <laughs> right. um, so Dead Fred's dead, clearly. He's a hiker that didn't make it. 
And one of his sayings is, you know, you can learn a lot about survival from a dead guy because he's been through it, right? He's, he's died. And so who better to tell you how not to die than a dead guy? And so Fred came to our casting call. Uh, he's crass. He's improper. Uh, I don't know if he's from New Jersey or what. He seems to have some sort of an accent. But he's dead, and we loved him. And he has some survival training, albeit from default. And so we hired him. And one of his favorite television shows is The Manson Family. The Manson Family, again, came to our casting call. Uh, they were desperate to be on TV, like a lot of people on the survival TV shows on network television. Uh, we didn't vet them, and they didn't care. They were willing to sign the, sign the waiver, you know, if you know what I mean. And uh, they get themselves into compromised situations, uh, to, to say, say it lightly, and so Dead Fred watches the Manson family, no connection to the Manson family on TV. And like that guy on the uh, South Park, who's the who's the character on South Park that always dies? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, man, what's that kid's name? Uh, Kenny? Isn't it Kenny? Yeah, Kenny, 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 yeah. Kenny. Yeah. The Manson family are a lot like Kenny, unfortunately. But they teach you what not to do. So it's really synonymous with, with, with network survival television shows, which also mostly teach you what not to do. Uh, Dr. Dingle. Yeah, what a, what a genius. I mean, I don't know where this dude is from. You know, it's some Slavic country. It's, you know, you know I mean, we're an equal opportunity employer on the survival show. <laughs> we're not going to, you know, but we did vet uh, the co-host for the show. Unlike most network television, the guy's a genius. So what he handles is the three P's of survival. He deals with the physics of heat loss and gain, hypohypothermia, the physiology of having a human body in a stress situation, and the psychology, like you brought up, of scared people. And so on season one, he talks about brown spiders and how not to drink your pee. That's bad. Don't drink your pee in a survival situation. But he does it from an academic standpoint because, again, Survival training involves a lot of, of heavy-duty science um, behind it, the physiology of why the body's breaking down, et cetera. And Dr. Dingle, right out of the shoot, I mean, he's a little bit, you know, he speaks okay English, you know. I mean, he's clearly he's got an accent, but he's a genius, had a big, heavy background in survival training. So, hey, man, we hired him. Don't drink your pee. Um, uh, th that might be the best advice of the show. Um, I, I'm going to, I, I want to get to the male girls. Um, but you said something earlier and it, it slipped past us. Uh, uh, let's circle back. Probably the one question on everybody's mind. And so let's just make it really quick. I just want to circle back. How long do you have now? You have all the variables. You have temperature. You have location. And that, but all things considered, if you don't have water, you don't have food, and you're walking in a in, in a dry, um, what what are we dealing with here? Is it hours? Can you make it through the night? Uh, what 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 what? Are, you know, how long do you have before you really have to panic? Cla you're talking classic desert survival situation, right? Yeah. Okay, so because your listeners deserve better, I'm going to go down. I love rabbit holes. I'm going to go down, and let's use you as an example, since you're drinking right now, so at least we know you're hydrated. Mm -hmm. What was Jimmy's last oral intake of food? That would factor in metabolic water in your body. When was your last oral intake of water, obviously? What health is Jimmy in? Are you sick? Are you good to go? Uh, what is the ambient temperature, literally? What are the convective wind speeds? Is there humidity? Is it like Baja by the Sea of Cortez, where it's hot plus humidity, which is a real killer because your sweat doesn't evaporate? Are you moving and how long have you been moving? Are you walking, running, jogging? Is there any cover? Is there any cover via your clothing? Are you covering your head, neck, and your torso like we talked about earlier? Is there any vegetation that you can use as cover, et cetera, et cetera? What are you doing? Are you digging your Jeep out of the ditch in a sand wash at noon? All those things will factor in to how much metabolic water Jimmy has. 
We're not talking about water you have in your Jeep, and I'm glad you do. We're talking about if you know what hits the fan, and here you are mm -hmm. in a human body, it has so much moisture, okay? And that's it, because you're not resupplying until you get rescued in the scenario you're given me. You can see how many variables there are. The hotter it is, the more humid it is, the less cover you have from solar radiation, the less water you've had before, et cetera. You know, there's been people that have found dead in the desert through autopsies. They died within hours. So that's not unheard of. And I'm talking hours. Um, you can lose up to 8.3 pounds a gallon of water an hour through your sweat if you do stupid stuff in the desert, like try to dig your car to the ditch at noon. That's 8.3 pounds of body weight in one hour. That's four quarts. So you can see how quickly the body can get compromised and the brain, the glucose, the functioning, the cognitive thought, the judgment can get compromise, compromised and Jimmy's out there spinning. And, you know, in, in season one of the survival show, I interview my original desert survival instructor, Dave Gancy, who pioneered stuff with the, the new team of SEALs called SEAL Team 6. This was in the 80s who taught the D-Boys, which are the original Delta Force. Just coming out, no one knew about Delta Force at that time. And I interviewed a, a, a Border Patrol, a Borstar agent. And Borstar, there's Bortech. Those are the guys that get into heavy weaponry. And there's Borstar on Border Patrol. And those are the real, they're all, you know, paramedics or, or below. They're the most medically advanced people dealing with what you're talking about, dealing with hyperthermia and dehydration, because they're usually on the southern border, although they go all over the world. And what happens to a person, because I asked this Border Patrol agent about death, and because he's seen a lot of dead bodies in the field, and he's rescued people to the point where they were almost literally a story he said was uh, a, a couple guys they found they were going to hang themselves. They were going to commit suicide if they weren't found, and they were found just the day before they were going to do that. And their clothes are stripped, their eyes are sunken, they don't bleed anymore from wounds because there's not enough moisture in the blood to bleed. This is a serious situation. And if you do everything wrong and don't have the resources that we talked about leading up into this big rabbit hole answer I'm giving, which is mm -hmm. the responsible answer for your listeners, you can literally die within hours in a true desert survival situation. And one of the reasons I said that's a real scary environment that, 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 I, that I feel that, that demands your respect as is that winter environment. So with you, when you said Mojave Desert, when you said the Jeep, when you said water, now here's another question you're going to ask me, how much water do I need per day to be out looking for you? who knows what in the Mojave? Old stats with uh, Arizona search and rescue, whatever, is one gallon per person per day, which is nonsense. I just told you you can lose that in one hour through your, through your sweat. What I would prefer, and again, 8.34 pounds is what a gallon of water weighs, but Jimmy's got a Jeep. You know, I have five-gallon jerry cans, and many of them, if I'm taking students out in the field, what I like is a rule of thumb, if I'm doing aggressive desert sort stuff and hot temperatures, three gallons per person per day is a comfortable thing for me, and that's a lot of water. So if you, if you take Martha out in your Jeep, all of a sudden, holy smoke, we're going to blow through this jerry can plus a gallon. But you can't get it from nothing, Jimmy. All these exotic solar stills and whatever, I teach them at my school. But I teach them to convince people to be prepared and carry their freaking water when they go into arid regions. That's my long-winded answer. No, it's a, it's a realistic answer. Um, and there's always the... Um, it's like uh, Radio 101 uh, going back, and and I always know a rookie host uh, when they ask this question. But but I'm going to ask you because it's it sounds like a rookie question, but we've already touched upon this a few times, and we're talking about it right now. Which is, if you had to go. Right. And you had you had the choice. Do you go in the desert and and you go out like that <laughs> or do you go out on the Arctic ice? You know, and, you know, if, if you're going to die, which which. But it's an honest answer. I mean, it, which where do you have the better fight for survival? 
Well, I'm shaking my head because you keep – literally, that was a fan question on the survival show. So you, you right, keep – Right, 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 right. Show, right? And um, hyperthermia, desert survival, hot weather, based on my talks and my research, very, very, very painful way to go. The people the Border Patrol find in the desert, they're stripped down. There's writhing. They've been convulsing, right, from right. the patterns in the sand. Nasty way to go. Hypothermia, cold weather survival, if the body's left undisturbed, the heart just beats slower and slower and slower until it stops. So if you were asking me which way I wanted to die, hypo or hyperthermia, hypothermia is the clear winner, right, because it's a lot less painful than hyperthermia. So that would be the way, if I had to choose, that would be right. the way I'd go. See, that was the perfect answer. I, 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 but see, we always have the issue, right? When we're in the middle of a hot summer, it's like, man, I wish it was, I, I miss the, I miss the winter, right? But you're in winter and you're like, man, I miss those hot summer days. <laughs> yep. It's just the way it is. The grass is always greener, right? So uh, uh, let's get to the male girls. I want to get the male girls in. The male girls, again, uh, we have uh, one named Angela and Annabelle. And the male girls uh, approach my trailer and deliver fan mail to me. And the fan mail could be they like the show. It could be a question on survival. could be a question on Dr. Dingle's 1970 Plymouth Barracuda with the 440 engine because he loves muscle cars. So it's just kind of a literal mail grab bag, um, and they deliver the mail to me, and I answer those questions uh, on the show, and that's their function. And they also know some survival training, too, so they're coming in educated. And since it's 1970s, green shag carpet and lava lamps, of course, they're wearing white go-go boots and mini skirts as well. You got to love that. Who is, yeah. who is, who is Mama? Mr. Mama, now this might interest some of your listeners. When we had the casting calls in Vegas, there was a Star Trek convention, lucky us, that was uh, in close proximity. Mr. Mama, uh, we were looking for someone to teach child survival that, that would come up with child survival songs. I don't know if Mr. Mama is from this solar system. I don't know how to put it any other way. Um, he or she or whatever is uh, doesn't look human, has antennas, has spots, and but as far as child survival songs, what a hell of a writer, you know. So Man. we pitched the material out, and we hired him or her or it. I got a lot. Man, you're the best, Cody, and we we've got to <laughs> hang out. Uh, I would I would love to uh, have you out here to the Mojave. I'll show you all of the flying saucers that you can handle and we can go out to the desert and and you can show me around and show me what's up and th th one of the things that i love to do and i would love to do it with you um i have everything to do it with but when you go out into the desert there is a peacefulness and a zen that is there you are at one with your mind and i love doing that but the other part of it is when you look around and there is nothing but sand, right? As far as the eye can see in both directions, you realize what a dangerous, dangerous place it is. And uh, that's that's the part that that I I I enjoy that. Not that the dangerous part, but there's a reason why it's called Death Valley, right? <laughs> it's not called. <laughs> And, and and that's where I live. And there is there's a serenity, there's a peacefulness, but it's there's there's a the danger element too as well. And I totally dig it. So yeah, man, the invitation is 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 right there. Come on out. Well, thank you very much. Good luck on the show. And when you see that UFO, I'm telling you, Cody, listen to me. You've put the intention out there. It's gonna sneak up on you. Right? It's going to sneak up on you, and I want to hear about it when it happens. And I, I call you when it happens, right? <laughs> Cody, you're the absolute very best. And thank you so much, and I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on your show.
the absolute very best. Cody Lundeen, everybody. His links are below. Uh, very easy to follow everything, Cody. The links are on social media over on our website and, of course, in the description below. Everything is right there. Perfect night on the show. Thank you so much, Cody. And uh, tomorrow I'm doing two different Arrow Report shows. I'm going to do one with Christina Gomez. This is her show. And then tomorrow night, the Arrow Report, the fade to black version, again with Christina Gomez. We're doing two shows tomorrow, two versions, two hosts, two guests. It's going to be amazing. I'll see everybody tomorrow. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, John Side. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow, which is all Arrow, all the time, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.